everyone. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here with you all. I would really like to appreciate uh, IntelliCAP for uh, initiating this whole dialogue between people who have ideas, aspiring entrepreneurs, and people who have resources who are willing to back those ideas. I think it's a very important uh, time in the, in the growth of a nation like India or the developing countries. So why would I say that? I would please go to the next slide. Can I, can I move the slide from here? Give me a remote or something. Just move to the next slide and just give me a remote. So this is my agenda for, the, uh, for the, this presentation. One is, uh, why are entrepreneurs the driving force of economy? I'll tell you a couple of reasons uh, on a lighter side. So somebody came from US. They said, I'm going to India to set up a business. I worked in a multinational for about 15 years. So uh, the person who kind of, was, he was looking up to a mentor. The mentor said, you go to India and you become a thief or a pickpocket. There is one inspector chasing you. You start a business, there are 15 inspectors that are going to chase you. So starting a business in India is not very easy. So many people who are aspiring, I really appreciate your guts and the, and the vision that you have. The second aspect is India does not rate very high on starting new business. It's about somewhere around the 125th on, on ease of starting a business in the country. So you, when you're trying to venture out into something, I think a, a lot of uh, uh, effort needs to go into this whole process and I really would like to congratulate each one of you for going there. I think the most critical element, you know, I'm sure you're hearing dialogue about, uh, you know, there is no need for an individual income tax. Most of the income tax, 10% of our GDP comes as tax revenue and that tax revenue comes from businesses. It could be a large business, it could be medium-sized business, small business. So 94% of the revenue comes purely from businesses or 91%. Individual income tax only contributes to 9%. So if each one of you aspiring entrepreneurs start working, you're only contributing to 9% of the potential money that is available for this economy to support uh, the entire uh, uh, stakeholders. So I really appreciate because you want to be part of the 91% solution. So let me move on to this macro space of healthcare. So I've kind of said why entrepreneurs are uh, critical. This whole macro space of healthcare is like any other macro space. It could be education, it could be water, it could be energy. So as I am familiar with healthcare, I'm just taking it up and elaborating a little bit more. So I'm sure all of us are familiar with this. You know, the, the country has gone through a tremendous change in the last decade and a half. We are all part of that change. We are kind of tip of the iceberg of what changes that could happen. We are all witnessing these. There is a rapid demographic transformation urbanization, fragmented family system, aging, and also changes in lifestyle, changes in food habits, and the technology. The whole framework has changed. The reference points have shifted, pretty much shifting every day as we go along. So what has happened to healthcare because of all these changes starting the, uh, from 1990s, early 1990s? Definitely there is more health awareness, better educated citizens, higher proportion babies born under medical supervisions. A lot of good things have come into uh, the country. The question that comes to our mind is, has this touched everyone in the society? Have we touched all the 1.2 billion people if you're referring to just India? Unfortunately, the answer is no. So as you can see from here, it is very obvious that a certain portion of our country in, in 2015, at least about 20% of our population still will earn about a dollar and 25 cents a day. So that's the population still not part of this whole growth agenda. So whole discussion probably here is how do you engage them in this whole process and build something sustainable so that they also contribute to this whole growth cycle and in the process they also climb up in the value chain of their own lives. So the formidable challenges in healthcare, sedentary lifestyle, increase in non-communicable disease, access to healthcare in some areas being unsatisfactory. The biggest problem, problem that would come is rise in medical costs. Healthcare inflation far outstrips your regular inflation. If your regular inflation, real inflation is say 7%, 8%, healthcare inflation is running at 15%, 18%. So if somebody had a surgery in 2000, early 2000, the same surgery would cost three times the cost today. So that's, that's actually a major challenge for all of us because most of the time when we talk about healthcare costs, we benchmark with the developed world and we say we are only one-tenth, but our per capita income is not even one-tenth. So it doesn't compare as well as uh, one would uh, like to think of. So the major threats to, in the space of healthcare, is 
obviously the shift to non communicable disease i'm sure you're familiar with diabetes hypertension cardiac problem pulmonary problems cancer all of that would come into this picture as the economy grows this is going to be a major challenge that we all face the other important aspect is uh, growing elderly people india has at this point of time they say close to 10% of the people above 60 so if you carve out a country of 120 million people we are probably the fourth or fifth largest country with people of above 60 years so this is going to be a major challenge japan is reeling under it it is affecting its economy it's affecting its growth so the same situation can come in our case our per capita income is also low so it's going to get compounded far more than what we see in a country like america or japan this is the this is about the healthcare cost i think this is going to be a, as i said a major challenge there was a time when poverty led to illness you know they had malnutrition you would have seen some of the pictures right children have not eaten they are skin and bones uh, you know so those are those are images that we don't see as much because pretty much all over the world the nutrition status has changed our basic health has pretty much been addressed to a large extent but the challenge now is imagine a person who gets an illness today gets a cardiac problem he goes into an intensive care unit and then gets a surgery you are talking about a budget of about 500000 rupees and this man would have worked for 25 years to collect that money as a corpus his pf his graduate all put together would be about 5 to 7 or 10 lakhs and he would have need to pay a loan of 5 lakhs for educating his children he again comes back into poverty so what where what he tries to do for two and a half decades to climb out one disease and 15 days in intensive care unit can bring him back to the same situation so all of us have to be a little more conscious about the costs when we refer to uh, in our context of developing countries this is pretty much our healthcare expenditure in the in the country we spend about 45 dollars uh, per person per year on healthcare of which government spends about 25% and out of pocket is 75% it's a very very small amount of money that goes into healthcare so the government has a plan to now take it from 1% to 3% of the gdp spend on healthcare i, I would like you to see this uh, comparison so obvious that is india and this is singapore singapore's per capita income is $50000 india's per capita income is $1500 singapore spends 3% of its gdp per capita income on healthcare so singapore spends $1500 on the well being of a person the whole gdp of india is only 1000 per capita income is only $1500 so the reason why i'm projecting is not to show you that we have a lot of problems definitely we do have a lot of problems big challenges but there comes a lot of opportunities i don't think singapore or us is going to be innovative in healthcare delivery they don't have to be there is abundance there we as a country we don't have those abundance we are constrained so here is a wonderful platform for all of us to be innovative for all of us to bring some solutions which can not only change care for our own people but can challenge the conventional beliefs of the developed nations i think that's where that's what we can contribute today if we can have a good solution i think every developed country is looking for it everybody has an unsustainable healthcare system our problems looks they are a lot better than what the problems of us or what the problems of uh, other developed countries are i'm kind of going to my next part you know this is more for aspiring entrepreneurs now i've been part of this organization for the past 20 years now this organization was founded in 1978 so over the decades we have learned some lessons i thought it will be good to share with you and if it clicks a chord with you that's exactly what we would like to happen so what is blindness a broad brush 39 million people are blind in the world of which about 12 million are in our country india has a, a substantial percentage of blind people in the in the world so he's our founder he founded this organization at the age of 58 after he retired from the government service dr venkat swami so this is his vision the, the vision he started was to eliminate needless blindness by providing high quality high volume compassionate eye care to all the challenge was eye care to all when you talk about eye care to all zero becomes a legitimate price point you need to provide care a substantial percentage of your care at a zero price point so how do you figure that uh, game of providing care at a zero price point so the one lesson that we he learned or we learned uh, together was you have to be unreasonable you can't be reasonable you can't be conservative you have to be unreasonable that's how you are able to grow the organization to achieve the purpose if 12 million people are blind you can't have a incremental model you may have to think 
at a certain scale and a certain uh, levels of economy so that you can take advantage of uh, all the things that would come with economies of scale. But being unreasonable does not mean that it has to be chaotic. There has to be a method to madness. There has to be an organized way of thinking. We can't jump around all over the place. And thanks to our founder, he also gave us a, a method to work and find out how to reach this purpose. So looking back at the organization, we feel we had these strong pillars, building blocks which help the organization. Very strong value system. The value system that says, whoever knocks your door, you provide eye care. The value system says, you keep your eyes on the care that you want to give, not on the monetary aspects of the, of the businesses as you scale up. So those are very strong value system. We still feel that those are the things that are holding the organization. He also was very fond of talking about McDonald's or Burger King. He said, if eye care can be provided the way that McDonald's are, is able to provide in every part of the world, the same facility, they're able to train somebody, a school dropout, to give the same food. It's not probably very similar, but you can take lessons like standardization, replication, training. All those things can be applicable to at least in eye care, it's possible to do all those things. If you really have to marry those two, zero price point and a very innovative delivery system, then you will have to find out and figure out a way things are done, which is not done conventionally by any organization at that point of time. So this is what Arvind was in 1976, started with about 11 beds. So we are today more in Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. So on a typical day, we would see about close to 10,000 patients. We do about 400,000 surgeries a year. It, is, it does about 8% of the country's eye care as of now and 2% of the world's eye care at this point of time. There is a lot of space to grow and, and probably we need to think of how to do that eventually. And the other important lesson that we have learned over a period of time is not be driven by the market, but you start driving the market. I'll give you three examples what, what had helped us from this paradigm of thinking. When Arvind was in the early 90s when we were providing eye care, we were doing one sort of surgery for the paying patients, putting an intraocular lens, and one sort of surgery for the free patients without an intraocular lens. So our founding team sat and said, if our mission is to give eye care to all the same way, why are we differentiating? Why are we compartmentalizing care? So that's how we got into manufacturing. In fact, we tried to negotiate with multinationals at that point of time. Nobody saw a business model. Nobody saw a business potential at that point of time. So these five doctors came together and said, why don't we explore manufacturing? And that's how we got into manufacturing, subsequently into consultancy and, and into research. So this is... Uh, uh, the Oro Lab, which is the manufacturing arm. It was established in 1992. Today, it has about 7% of the global market share. And it's a standalone organization. It's more than sustainable and reaches more people than Arvind Eye Care System in terms of individuals that it touches annually. And the other important thing that we have learned is it is not about one organization. You need to create an ecosystem so that every provider of eye care tries to become better, then you can survive as an organization. You just can't have one center of excellence and all the rest rotting in the country. So a lot of sharing, a lot of learning went on over the years and that's how Lions Arvind Institute of Community Ophthalmology came. We pretty much worked with a lot of countries in the, a lot of hospitals in the, in the country as well as in other aspects of the, other parts of the developing country. And also a basic research. See, this is another challenge that we are facing. Most of the research that is happening are happening in the developed countries. 99% of the research dollars are in the developed countries addressing developed country problem. And I wouldn't blame them. It is their resources. They are addressing their problems. And it is high time now we start addressing our own problems. As our economy gets better, as our surpluses are getting better, and this is a time to plow in and try to address and not be dependent on someone else for our own solutions. The other important lesson that we have learned is boundaries. Where do you draw your boundaries when you start an organization or when you start uh, trying to address a, a certain challenge? Effective patient care is a journey. I'm just giving you an example. Imagine a patient comes to... Can I have the next? Can I have the previous slide? How do I move back? Can you just take the previous slide? For some reason, it's not coming. So what it does is, you know, from awareness to getting care, it's a whole spectrum of things that one does. Most of the time, when you talk about healthcare delivery, you're only talking about intervention, a very narrow space of uh, what you do. So this is something which we learned over the years. 
where we draw the boundaries determines our opportunities so if we can draw a boundary much larger it may take some time you may enter the spectrum at one level but ensure that you are covering the whole spectrum as much as possible because the patient does not know where he fits into the spectrum you as a provider know where he fits into the spectrum i'll give you one example if somebody gets a, 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 a myocardial infarction a heart attack where does the disease start does the disease start when he started having uncontrolled cholesterol when we had a blood pressure when he had diabetes or the disease happened when he had a a stroke or a myocardial infarction this is because of accumulative damage has happened over the last decade or two so how do you take responsibility for the whole spectrum and not look at just interfering when the problem arises this has given us a lot of opportunities uh, over the years most of our services are designed for non customers because served customers in this field are very small 10 20% of people who need eye care are being covered even today so there are 80% of the people who are non customers how do you go after them structurally and you make mistakes all of us make mistakes you fall down what you are hearing about is success versus avarvin if i can have to make a presentation on the failure that will be a 10 times larger presentations but over the years you learn you fall down you get up and people teach you and you can learn from other industries as well and this is outreach program you can do everything within your own premises you need to go to the community and take care of their i care needs as well interestingly when we did this i care i camp work we felt very happy because there was a lot of momentum every week we are going to 30 Uh, community outreach programs we are trying to scare, uh, screen people for eye care and when we did a study he said what is the impact that we are making with these uh, eye camps to a surprise only 7% of the potential people who needed eye care were getting eye care the reason was we did not have a fixed facility what we were trying to tell these people in the villages or in the rural area was every eye care condition can wait till we come the next time that's probably true for cataract but not true for a glaucoma or a diabetic retinopathy or somebody getting an injury you will have to have a presence then and there to take care of those problems so this is for the first time we are confident now for a 50000 population we are able to saturate eye care we are able to go to 25 to 30% penetration within the first 2 years so that gives us a, a, a fair amount of comfort that we are reaching everybody who needs eye care in that small community we need to scale it up we have covered about a 3.5 million population it's a small uh, on a 1200 million population but it's a good beginning is what we feel the other important element that we have learnt is how do you benchmark your institution you know when you when you start something like an uh, like a solution for a problem the existing benchmarks are very inadequate the existing benchmarks have all the inefficiencies that are built into the system so the lesson that we have learned is to challenge the existing benchmarks don't take them as a given but at least hit 100% or 1000% below the existing benchmarks that are there i'll give you an example so when i say benchmarks in all these levels you know quality and excellence efficiency effectiveness patient safety patient centered care so this is a comparison between national health service uk versus urban so number of surgeries that urban does is about 400000 surgeries now uk does about a little about 600000 surgeries so this is the complication rate arvin's complication rate is is pretty less than uh, what is this in a, in uk it, it's understandable because when you build a certain scale when you build a certain level of efficiency people become good at doing what they are doing and this is not very different toyota is obviously a better manufacturer and they are also the largest manufacturer so they go pretty much hand in hand when it comes to efficiency and outcome so this is the cost differential the cost of giving care for uk is about 1.6 billion pounds on their 600000 surgeries and for arvind is about 14 15 million pounds for the 400000 surgeries that we do so if you kind of took the 1.6 billion as a starting point you'll be happy with even 160 million but you need to i mean you have to challenge those conventions so that we can fundamentally create new ways of thinking and new opportunities will start surfacing like we got into manufacturing we got into consulting so all those opportunities came because we were willing to look at benchmarks which are not non existent at that point of time and also another important lesson that we have learned is stretching scarce resource you know, resource constraint is a wonderful as i said opportunity to innovate and uh, try out new things so with one surgeon two surgical tables two scrub nurses the same ophthalmologist productivity jumped by 600 to 800% in a country where there is less 
human resource available that was one of the wonderful ways to expand or 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 magnify that person's capacity and that helped us to be productive and this is a you know this is a comparison between all the other countries even the other other organizations uh, more more in the government and the private most of them are inefficient not because they are individually not good because the collective system is not efficient it's creating that whole ecosystem that leads to the efficiency the same doctor works at arvind the same doctor will go and work at elsewhere so the doctor is not does not make the difference it's creating that whole flow of patients flow of inventory flow of uh, systems that need to organize the flow all of that have to come together to be able to accomplish this and also another thing that we have learned is you know when you don't have trained manpower how do you recruit village young women from the village after their 12th standard and then try to train them so we recruit about 600 young women every year cumulatively we have trained about 18000 women over the last two and a half decades so this becomes a, a sustainable workforce you are making a difference in their lives and they are making a difference in the organization's life and also those millions of patients who show up to the organization so they pretty much do all the routine tasks and doctors are high up in the system the value chain so you need to debottleneck them as much as possible and this workforce lets us to debottleneck them uh, comfortably coming to the lesson next lesson is when do you think of the organization's dna you can't think of it after you get the money you can't think of it when you're doing well you will have to think of it in the early stages you have to you, you those are things that you are not tempted to change whatever resources whatever valuations you get so it is important to understand that over a period of time and lot of times when organizations scale up from a limited view of what whatever we have seen they try to align systems and activities that goes very strongly people bring in technology people bring in everything but they forget to align people to the purpose so i think you need to have that alignment consistently built over a time it's easy to get carried away when you're successful it's easy to get carried away when 10 people are behind you appreciating your idea and are willing to back your idea so you'll have to be very clear and articulated pretty much like write it and put it somewhere very clear to see and follow it so that you are not swayed by what is happening in the external uh, ecosystem but you're driven by what you started your organization for in the first place the other important element that we have learned over a period of time is more money is more problem financial resources are not a panacea for all our uh, problems in fact it is better to have less money consistently being hungry keeps you uh, more sane with more money we all tend to get a little foolish and little little disruptive in our own thinking so what we have learned over a period of time in arvind hospital the core activity is never to raise money for our core activity of eye care we need to do it on our own that's a choice of what we have taken part of the reason was we didn't have this ecosystem in the 1970s we had to do this uh, only organically as as we built the organization one one bed at a time or one patient at a time so looking back that has helped us to build this culture that has helped us to look at all the resources available in the world and stand out and say is this all that is going to help me or what is it i am going to value and build the organization over the next uh, say decades i'll give you one example there is a temple in the town i come from minakshi temple minakshi temple was built over 10 generations one king in the first generation conceived the plan it's an 18 acre plan and the 10th generation built the temple and it's standing for 1000 years how many of us are building an organization over the next 10 generation that can stand for 1000 years i think that's a very different paradigm you're not in a hurry you're not uh, the finish line is not there you're not even going to finish you're just going to pass the baton to someone else so that brings you a, a lot of stability in your thinking and you don't get carried away you know i think those are important paradigms to important thought processes to have in one's mind when you are trying to build an organization i'm going to kind of coming to my end of my presentation the other important aspect is we all give a a lot of importance to leadership and it is very critical all of us all of you know all of you aspiring uh, entrepreneurs are leaders you know you have to today you will raise the money and start the place but people are going to look up to you you will have 10 people five people 500 people all of them are going to look up to you and you are kind of crowded with a lot of responsibilities 
you can't have a, a central office to begin with to break up all these responsibilities but what we have learned over a period of time what is critical for leadership as the organization grows and evolves is only this continue to sustain the passion continue to infect the organization and keep the organization aligned and in line with the purpose because that is one thing that is lost immediately as your organization becomes successful not lose the focus of why you came into existence in the first place let me kind of conclude uh, with all the lessons learned being unreasonable but with a structure in mind not trying to be uh, chaotic defining boundaries opens up opportunities benchmarking moving beyond expectations moving beyond wild expectations even you will be surprised on what one could do dna build the values and systems around the vision be passionate as a leader and keep aligning the organization consistently this is the last lesson i'm going to share uh, from our founder why you're all here is not because somebody is willing to back your idea it's a million dollar idea or a billion dollar idea because you are happy that you're doing something beautiful all of you have intelligence all of us have intelligence all of us have capabilities but to discover what is beautiful and what means makes sense for us is a very critical element and that's what we have learned from our founder thank you